Hi, welcome to Zion Church. It's good to have you with us this morning. This is your first time here. It's good to see you. Come on in. Boy, look at the legs on that one. Boy, if I wasn't married. Whew. No, I'm not going with you to the counselor. This whole marriage has been all about you. Well, now it's about me for a change. I'm done. You hear me? It's over. I didn't do that. No, seriously. I swear to God. Give me a stack of Bibles. I'll put my right hand up to heaven. I didn't do that. She thinks she got away with something. Well, I'll tell you, nobody treats me that way. Just when she thinks she's comfortable, nobody crosses me. Sound like anybody you know? Sound like you? When it's somebody I know, I can laugh about it. When it's me, uh... one of the real problems with looking at the Sermon on the Mount is that we tend to see it as a new list of rules. Don't lust, don't divorce. Don't swear. Don't get even. This is what Jesus said we're not supposed to do. And then reality sets in and we find ourselves struggling. And the Christian life becomes a burden. One man I once visited in the hospital after bypass surgery once told me, I plan to go home and try to be a better Christian. And I wonder what that looks like. Did he plan to go home and try to follow the rules better? Try to be more loving? What does it mean to be a good Christian or even a better Christian? Jesus didn't begin his ministry with a list of rules. This is what you have to do to have eternal life. This is what you have to do to go to heaven. He began instead with an invitation. What we call the Beatitudes is Jesus' invitation to come and experience, to taste and see the wonder of a relationship with God. And when we begin looking at the Sermon on the Mount, from that perspective, it changes everything. But Jesus doesn't just leave it in the realm of theory. He points at specific examples from real life. Because people gathered around him, listening to him, knew the struggle of lust, knew the struggle of dealing with divorce, knew the struggle of taking an oath and not being able to keep it, knew the struggle of getting even or being the object of someone's revenge. And his point was, keeping the rules the way the teachers have told you to not only doesn't work, it doesn't address the real problem. The root of the problem is a matter of the heart. You've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. So the person who never ever sleeps with someone who isn't their spouse can feel I've fulfilled that requirement of the law, I've never committed adultery, I must be okay. But Jesus defines the problem a little differently. In this passage from Matthew, 
He says, the problem is the one who looks at a woman with lustful intent in his heart. It's not just what the body does, it's a matter of the heart. And Jesus' answer to the problem comes to us from Matthew 5. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than that the whole body should be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to lose one member than your whole body be thrown into hell. How many of you this morning are blind in one eye because you followed this command of Jesus? Nobody, apparently. Can you hold up the stump that shows that you've been serious about following Jesus? No. So either you've got this lust thing completely under control, or it doesn't bother you at all, or maybe Jesus means something else. Obviously, he doesn't mean this literally. Because even a blind man can lust he's telling us two things first take sin seriously lust is a common issue take it seriously but Jesus is also being a little bit sarcastic here Jesus sarcastic He did it more often than we'd like to give credit for because he wanted to grab our attention and shove it in our faces, but gently enough that it would slip past our defenses. He said, it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. It isn't your body that gets thrown into hell. So what in the world does he mean by that? He's saying that physical cures for heart problems are futile. Across the centuries, there have been groups of men who have banded together and made a solemn commitment to each other never to be in the presence of a woman, never to look at a woman, never to do anything that reminded them of a woman. They wanted to follow this command of Jesus not to lust. It didn't work. Because the solution to that problem is not out here. The solution is in here. It begins with that heart that's surrendered to him. That's what the invitation in the Beatitudes is all about. Before you start coming up with a list of rules that would make you a good Christian, begin with that relationship with God where he actually takes up residence in your heart and changes you. And now you have the capacity to come to him and say, Father, those legs are a temptation for me. It's not her fault. She's an attractive woman. She's well built. And that's not sin. Hear that. Temptation. Being tempted is not sin. Jesus was tempted. But he never sinned. And so in this particular issue, the temptation doesn't come in the first look. It's if you maintain that look. Or you look again. And the imagination begins to do all kinds of incredible things. I haven't yet mentioned the issue of pornography because we tend to think of porn as a lust issue. It's really an intimacy issue. Every man, every woman ever created by God, which is all of us, was designed for intimacy. An honest and open and vulnerable relationship with someone who's very different from you. And 
We were designed by God to reflect him. And remember, he is three, but one, three different and yet unified. God designed us to have the kind of relationship that he has in himself. Different, but united. And in our fallen world, intimacy is hard work. And it can be terrifying. What if she finds out that I really don't like ketchup with my eggs and she's been serving that to me for 37 years? I'll just keep eating that disgusting breakfast. Intimacy is hard work and it can be terrifying. And so the quick and fake intimacy of porn is so much easier and so much less threatening. There's no fear of being inadequate. There's no messy relationship. Much like the cup that I was pouring for the kids this morning. When God pours that love into us, things will get messy. We won't have the control we would like. Porn is quick and easy and no messiness of a relationship. But like every other addiction, porn takes more and more from you and gives less and less to you. And you don't even realize that you are building a tolerance that needs more and more and receiving less and less and you eventually lose the capacity for real intimacy as God intended it. Lust is a matter of the heart. And Jesus' answer to the problem is not to cut off your hand or gouge out your eye. It's not to go find some place where there are no women around. No place you'll never be tempted. It's to have the kind of relationship with the Father that reminds you of who you are are i'm talking a lot to men this morning because most of my experience in life has been as a man thank you for laughing but the reality is women are not immune to lust and particularly in the sex saturated society that we live in today the thinking is that somehow Sex is the ultimate expression of intimacy that will leave you breathless. And the reality is, it's a very, very tiny part, a big part, but a very tiny part of intimacy. And when Jesus invites every one of us to come to that relationship with the Father, He's inviting us to the kind of relationship in which God knows every single flaw and fault and defect and still loves you. You will never surprise him. You will never disappoint him because he already knows. In spite of everything that you are and have done, God thinks you are one of the best things he's ever made on this planet. Psalm 8 has a wonderful, wonderful passage to remind us of this relationship. And it begins by grounding us firmly in reality. When I look at the works, look at your heaven and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, God inhabits this universe and he looks around and he sees what he's made. God is so creative and so hugely creative that he never ever gets bored. Astronomers have recently found a nebula far from us. 
The nebula, if we can measure this in miles, typically things are measured in light years, but to give us an idea, the nebula from our perspective on Earth is very, very long this way. It is six trillion miles long. We get fascinated by looking at the Grand Canyon. This thing would make the, grand, the entire planet Earth look like an infinitesimal speck on the corner of some godforsaken galaxy way out there somewhere. A trillion miles long. And God gets to enjoy all that wondrous, wondrous creativity that is invested in the universe. When I look at your heaven, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, the six trillion mile nebula that you have put in place, what are we? What are we? I'll tell you what we are. We are the beings that God has made only a little lower than the heavenly beings. We are the beings that God has crowned with glory and honor. God has a six trillion mile nebula to fascinate him, and he would much rather hang out with you. Say, what? Because in all the known universe, even in the face of a six trillion mile nebula, only we can choose to have a relationship with the Father. And that's what he calls you to. You are one of the best things I ever did on this planet, and I want to be your friend. That statement is enough to remind you every single day, I'm not garbage, I'm not worthless, I'm not inadequate. There's a lot of stuff in this life that tells me that I am. There's a lot of stuff in here that tells me that I am, but my Father tells me every single day who I really am. Jesus used these four examples to demonstrate the difference between Someone who's trying to live by the rules and thinking they've done everything right because they're living by the rules. And someone who has a kingdom heart. And in that relationship with the Lord, they discover that they have what they need to deal with these very real issues in their hearts. These four are not the only issues but they're very true to life. And Jesus says, whatever the issue is, it's not about trying to keep the rules and be a good Christian. It's about having the relationship with him that reminds, him, reminds you of who you are. And that wondrous relationship will push those things away. Yes, you're going to fall, you're going to fail, you're going to mess up, you're going to have that moment of lust, you're going to have that moment of revenge, you're going to say something you wish you hadn't said. You may even find yourself hardening your heart against your mate when you know better. And Jesus says, in the middle of whatever this is, come to me. And you will find me not scolding you because you've been a bad boy or a bad girl, but reminding you of who you are so that you can live the truths of the Sermon on the Mount. Will you pray with me?